Hello movie lovers. Today I'm going to talk about a recent Criterion Blu-ray release. This is the 1951 film Miracle in Milan and it is directed by Vittorio De Sica with a screenplay by Cesar Zavattini. A beautiful 4K restoration for anybody who loves black and white cinema, appreciates the beauty of all that it can um, deliver. This is just a gorgeous, gorgeous restoration. And it's a, a story that's basically a fable, a fairy tale. It's a, it begins with the proverbial line, once upon a time, a baby is in a cabbage patch, an old lady um, who lives there, uh, finds him, uh, takes him in, adopts him. Uh, she shows him love and kindness, but of course she, she dies when he's still a young boy. She, he gets sent to an orphanage. Um, and all of this is <clears throat> compressed in just the first few minutes of the film. And, but he get, and when he gets out, he is his, uh, the influence of this old, old lady who has become his mother uh, sticks with him. Uh, the love and kindness is there. He believes in it. He believes in it uh, ab absolutely. The world he finds himself in 1951 is is a bombed out Milan was was severely um, uh, shelled during during World War II. And of course, he has no job and no opportunities, so he gets involved with a group of homeless people that are living in an empty, large empty lot that with a lot of junk piles uh, close to railroad tracks. And and uh, he uh, he had he he has this great ability to organize and the charisma of his love and kindness is infectious with these homeless people, and he they now begin to to uh, construct uh, similarly ragtag houses, but uh, with more uh, stability to them. There's streets, there's streets names, there's a plaza. They find an old. Um, an old uh, statue, and they put that up in the middle of the plaza. It's, it's a microcosm of society, only these are poor homeless people with, without much, uh, without much um, uh, chance uh, to improve themselves. Um, society doesn't seem to care about them. Of course, the land proves to be valuable. It's private property. Uh, an evil rich man comes to uh, dispossess them and, um, and so this is very much this is very much uh, a story of neorealism. Uh, the screenwriter Cesar Zavattini was uh, one of the main proponents uh, and of uh, neorealism, uh, which is basically using non-professional actors, um, filming as much as possible on location, uh, having an interest in the poor, uh, social problems of the of the times, which were uh, overlooked by a more commercial cinema. So Bicycle Thief, Zavattini, the Sika collaboration, um, Shoeshine, uh, and in between Shoeshine and Umberto D, all, all classic uh, neorealist films, comes this miracle in Milan. So this is neorealism, but it's also magical realism. And, <clears throat> and the miracle of the title is not really uh, meant to be a kind of religious uh, miracle. It's sort of just, uh, it, it just happens, <laughs> it comes about. Um, and this kind of neorealism, this magical realism aspect of neorealism uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, very influential on, on some South American writers of the magical realism school. Uh, uh, Marquez, who wrote 100 Years of Solitude, was exposed to the film in the early 50s and, 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 and influenced by it. He, th he thought this was a terrific film. Um, and, um, <clears throat> uh, and it, 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 but coming between um, Bicycle Thief and Umberto D and uh, it didn't satisfy this, this sort of uh, whimsical fable, didn't satisfy anybody, it was not a hit movie. Um, it was, it was, a hit in other countries and won awards around uh, around the world, uh, but for for the left wing, which is where Zabatini uh, and, uh, comes comes from, and uh, they they thought it was it wasn't harsh enough. What's all this miracle stuff? And you know this is just fantasy. 
And then on the right wing, of course, it was showing Milan as uh, you know disrespecting the the uh, the, the city, the state, uh, and disrespecting even more so disrespecting rich people. Rich people aren't aren't certainly not evil, so it it didn't have many friends. Um, but um, <clears throat> it certainly is a friend in Criterion because they put out a beautiful edition. I love the artwork on this, and uh, in, the, in the we have artwork even on the desk, and, and uh, a lovely booklet comes with it, and there's some more artwork on the front and the back. And, um, and uh, as, as part of the extras, and there's lots of terrific extras in this, in this film, uh, or in this edition, uh, we get, in this booklet we get, uh, this is the mother of, and that's little Toto. Toto is, is the main character. Uh, the little boy that's found in the cabbage patch, and she was actually a, 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 um, a famous actress. And, and uh, even though they were the uh, the uh, impetus of neorealism was to use non-professional actors, they often used professional actress actors. And especially and in in uh, Miracle in Milan, uh, all the major parts are played by professional actors, but. Uh, Vittorio De Sica, director, went to um, uh, soup kitchens and he found actual homeless people. And part of the, um, the uh, appeal of this film is the authenticity of how these people look and how they dress and how, uh, how they live their lives. And uh, it doesn't romanticize them, but it shows that the influence of, of, of goodness uh, is, uh, is something, is, is something, uh, is, is, has a power to it. Uh, it is goodness is the title of the essay and that's Toto there uh, in, the, in the beginning part of when they're constructing their their uh, their makeshift uh, city of homeless people. And amongst this uh, professional cast is an uh, actress by the name of Brunella Bovo and she plays the love interest. This is Toto here and, and that is Brunella Bovo and you see them and as, as their um, kind of uh, romantic relationship uh, evolves. And, and she, I noticed her, I mean, I recognized her, but I couldn't place her. Where did I see her? <laughs> it's really, my memory is so bad. Because she was, the following year, I believe, she was in a Federico Fellini movie, probably my favorite Federico Fellini, The White Sheik, where she is really good. And she plays this uh, young woman who is absorbed in these... Uh, comic book fantasy uh, where they actually film the fantasies and, and she has this uh, before they become drawings and, and she has this relationship with uh, uh, or this uh, love for uh, the actor the main actor in that played by Alberto Sordi so she got she got in two years she didn't have an extensive film career but in those two years she had Miracle in Milan and the White Sheik and, she, and, and there's an interview with her from maybe the 1990s or so, and she's just a delightful interviewee and uh, uh, looking back on her career and what fun it was to work for Vittorio De Sica and how he discovered her. Um, and <clears throat> also in the supplements, uh, we uh, get an interview with a, um, with a uh, uh, film, a critic, uh, historian, I didn't write his name down, David Borgaris, and he talks about neorealism, the history of it. Zabatini, one of the main proponents of, um, uh, of neorealism, but it wasn't just film, it was music, it was, it, it was a whole uh, music art. Uh, Zabatini was an artist as well as a filmmaker. Uh, it, it, it was, it was a, a, an established movement, though it was a loose kind of movement, it didn't have like a, uh, you know, tenets of uh, this is what neorealism is. And of course, as the 1950s went on, neorealism uh, went off in all different kind of direct directions because Fellini too has his, uh, has his um, uh, early days. He was very much involved with all the filmmakers of neorealism, uh, including his first film that he made with Alberto Atalata. Um, and then we get uh, an, an audio uh, uh, with um, Vittorio De Sica audio interview where he looks back, I guess this is from the early 60s, and, um, 
and his sort of uh, disappointment, disillusionment with cinema that nobody, by the 1960s, nobody was interested in making these kind of politically engaged movies anymore. And he used to help finance his movies because he was, Vittoria De Sica was a big movie star, so he would appear in these commercial films for, uh, with big, with, uh, you know, good salaries and then pour the salaries into the making of the films that he really wanted to make. Um, and then we get a, um, <clears throat> a, a full-length 2019 documentary on Zavattini, and uh, this, is, this one is really good. I mean, it uh, covers his whole life, and the Italian cinema in the post-war era is, is one of the most overlooked. I know Solitary Ronan over his channel has really uh, gone through so much of, uh, of uh, discovering and, and bringing to light so many of the terrific uh, Italian films of, of this era. And, it, it, you know, the, there was French films and Japanese films, and but the Italian cinema is a lot more than just Federico Fellini. There's a lot of a lot of uh, great stuff, including some of the films I got there. There's Francesco Rossi's Christ Stopped at Eboli. Uh, one of my favorite filmmakers, Antonio Peggiangeli, as Adjua and his friends, and um, so it's good to see another edition of of Italian cinema. Uh, you know, wherever you can get it. And, this, this is certainly a really good, it's a, uh, it's a very entertaining film and, and it's got a lot of great, great moments, I think, uh, um, scattered throughout it. Uh, they, that, that cover is, is the sunlight. This was, a, this was an overcast, smoky uh, atmosphere in Milan. That's the industrial center of, of Italy and there was hardly any sunlight. So as when they're in their, in their town, when a, when the sun came out and a ray of sunlight would come, everybody would run to this ray of sunlight. And then when the sun they would disappear, somebody would discover another ray of sunlight 50 yards away and they'd go running to stand and just to get into the sun. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody who listened. I really do appreciate it. Comments are always welcome. Take care.